In this edition of Idle Gossip, fellas frock up, costly cinema catastrophes, and Notorious Nicholson. It's Hollywood's Night of Nights. Say your prayers, genuflect deeply, and think pleasant thoughts. Some will win, some will lose, and many will fall victim of severe frock distress. Fashion police are on hand to escort those who shouldn't be there to a land far away. Hilary Swank, that must be cold. A very daring outfit for a second time winner. The dark blue is far from regal though. She's more like some kind of futuristic disco nun. And there's not even cover for a teensy thong down there. And by the way, there's no pockets. So where are you going to put the Oscar if you need to use your hands? Hmm? Kate Blanchett raided Granny's costume jewelry stash. Valentino made the pale yellow taffeta gown with the huge whale tail nailed to the back end. Look out, Kate. Penelope is onto the yellow taffeta thing. Madame, how many poor defenceless animals had to die to give you that? There were pearls, diamonds, and as we can see, rubies as well. None, of course, were owned by any of the poor struggling actors who braved the paparazzi to be there. Natalie Portman was there with her little crown on. What a sweetie. And Leonardo seemed stuck with a case of Howard Hughes hair. Nobody does the jewels better than Dame Liz, and it sure snazzes up the pyjamas she's wearing. Does Donatella know where she's going? Obviously not. I wonder who she's wearing. Certainly is camp. Uh, well, the Elton up, uh, looks like a chipmunk, or maybe the rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. But we shouldn't tease, because his Oscar party is a huge fundraising event for AIDS research and support. But he certainly is cute with the glasses and... Elton, is that a new hairline? Very nice. Look, it's Brooke. Where have you been, darling? Where have you been? My God, she's been to the gym. Look at that shoulder. And Pamela turned... Wait, that's not Pamela. There she is. Pamela turned up with some of Dolly Parton's old wigs. Halle Berry is wearing Versace. The flat hair is very now, but she gives the impression she's just been rained on. I thought cats didn't like water. And after this grilling by the fashion inspector, I think we'll let the stars enjoy their Oscar party. Until next time. Fashion police, over and out. What is it about guys on film dressing in women's clothing? Is it the makeup, the outfits, the wigs, or the girls just want to have fun attitude dressing in drag promotes? Who can say? If you haven't frocked up for the cameras, you haven't lived. Take a male star, insert him into a dress and draw on an outrageous amount of mascara and voila! A goyle. Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon were the first major Hollywood stars to don full drag in Some Like It Hot. Many leading men of the day were considered for the roles, most turning it down, fearing the stigma of dressing in women's clothing. I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. The film became legendary, and a decade later, a movie now known as a cult classic reminded audiences just how much fun a guy with a full face of makeup could be. I'm here with nothing to worry about. <laughs> the film version of the underground musical hit, The Rocky Horror Show, featured more cross-dressing males than you could poke a stiletto at. 
The movie was dead in the water on release, but as a handful of theatre owners began screening the flick as a late show, the piece found its following and a worldwide phenomena caught on. Tim Curry played the ultimate camp vamp, Dr. Frankenfurter. Come up to the lab and see what's on the slab. The images and songs from the Rocky Horror Picture Show have become a part of pop culture. And this wicked walk on the wild side is still being shown at midnight screenings around the world. Time passed and a million steps to the right were taken. The time was at last right for a credible actor to don a wig and heels and really show the world what it was like to be a woman. The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Great Scott! In one of his best roles, Dustin Hoffman in Tootsie was mildly convincing in middle-aged drag as Dorothy Michaels, soap actress. All right, just shut your mouth right now. When you talk to me, you talk to me professionally. You don't get personal. That is totally inappropriate behaviour. Though a huge comedy hit starring a stellar cast, nobody was man enough to imitate Dustin's dance with drag and the male as female theme was put back in Hollywood's closet to be safely ignored for another 10 years. While so many others were ooing and aahing at computer generated dinosaurs, a low budget Australian film made dressing up in drag box office gold. What kind of cabaret do you do? We dress up in women's clothes and parade around mouthing the words to other people's songs. The film was Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Guy Pearce, Terence Stamp and Hugo Weaving starred in this road trip adventure flick that was a hit around the globe and awarded an Oscar for Best Costumes. In the true style of any thrifty showgirl, the famous thong dress was made for only $7. Hello. Could I please it's undeniable that the success of Priscilla, of Queen Mary. of the Desert paved the way for independent films featuring drag and transsexual characters. How many times do I have to tell you green is not your colour? <laughs> like John Cameron Mitchell's Hedwig and the Angry Inch, without the rapture Priscilla received, funding for such a project would have been near impossible to find. Today, Hollywood's attitude to drag characters translates to dollar signs. Even the odd drag queen is getting a shot at the big time as well. Actresses, relax. There's no chance of your roles being given to drag queens, but just in case you do end up in a competition with a crossy. Make the hair big, the makeup thick, and honey, no dull fabrics, if you please. You actually make money by dressing up like a woman? Oh, sure. I can make a fine living in a pair of heels. There's an often mentioned superstition surrounding the recipients of Academy Awards. They say that once you win, your career takes a nosedive. Is it a spooky kind of curse where the ghosts of all the losers come and get you out of spite and jealousy? Not at all. The drift is that once you win the award, you have more thrust as a star and can command a higher fee for your acting work. The truth is that some actors do ask for more money, but they don't always get it. In addition, filmmakers wanting to offer you a part may not even bother, assuming now you have the Oscar glamour on your side, you will be too busy, too costly, or just too good for their project. Most winners agree though, an Oscar win is not a career boost. Since winning Best Actor, Kevin Spacey has had the power to greenlight several unsuccessful films. The latest, his much whispered about vanity project Beyond the Sea. He has seemingly fallen into the trap of other male Oscar winners who are dyed in the wool character actors but have believed the Oscar hype and now think they're leading men, able to play all kinds of romantic and dashing parts. Stop, stop! You gotta be kidding me. 
Halle Berry won Best Actress for Monsters Ball and after her next projects, dug into the litter tray as Catwoman. Unfortunately for Halle, she missed the side and this stinker of a film saw her win the Worst Actress Razzie Award. I'll do what my mother taught me and I'll stand here graciously. I'll take the criticism, take it as a lesson learned and I hope to God I never see these people ever again. <laughs> Gina Davis won Best Supporting Actress and followed that up with a nomination for Thelma and Louise. Two shockers later, her career was in trouble, so was her marriage, and the Oscar curse seemed to prevail. Though Afro-American roles are few and far between, Cuba Gooding Jr. has continued to appear on the big screen. Following Jerry Maguire, Cuba was in the mood to be shown some of the money, but unfortunately, that was as good as it got. As these stars discovered, the golden statue will not do much more than look good on the mantelpiece. Most mainstream movies cost big bucks, and boy do we mean big. After the stars get their fee, the costs certainly add up. That's why a box office flop is not something you want on your resume. What denotes a box office flop? That's easy. If the film costs over 50 million and only returns one or two, it's a bona fide flopperoo. What cost $56 million to make, a few more million to promote, and starred two A-list stars who were having a highly publicised relationship at the time? Gigli did. What's Gigli? No, it's not a new brand of tea bag. Hello. It was a Ben and Jen vehicle that one critic described as the worst movie of our new century. The movie was a dud, a bomb, plain shocking. And poor old Ben and Jen bombed pretty soon after the movie sank too. I'm the bull, you're the cow. You got that? Yeah, I got it, bull cow. John Travolta has starred in his fair share of disappointments, but none flopped on the scale of Battlefield Earth. Set in the futuristic year 3000, humanity is enslaved and John Travolta camps it up as a platform-heeled, dreadlocked alien overlord. Oh, whatever. One critic's comment, a million monkeys with a million crayons would be hard-pressed in a million years to come up with something as cretinous as Battlefield Earth. Enough said? Kevin Costner knows only too well the tightrope walked when making a costly motion picture. His ocean-set Waterworld was labelled a box office bomb, but it eventually returned a profit. Bitten by the big budget bug, so to speak, Kevin followed Waterworld with The Postman. Profits from the post-apocalyptic picture remain undelivered. With a tagline that reads, somewhere between Earth and Uranus, you'll find Pluto Nash. It's little wonder Eddie Murphy refused to promote this movie. Eddie Murphy is Pluto Nash. Pluto? Pluto Nash. It is a pleasure to meet me. Pluto Nash had been reportedly in development since 1980. After completion, the film sat gathering dust on a shelf at Warner Brothers for two years before release. Obviously in the hope it would get better like a bottle of fine wine. Well, some wine is just bogus from the start. Catch my drift? A pleasure to meet you, Pluto. Pluto turned out to be a dog, and sadly for Warner Brothers, millions disappeared into a black hole. These big budgets are certainly not chicken feed, and if the fans don't flock, the box office goose is well and truly cooked. It's turkey time. Why do some actors often get cast only playing the bad guy in movies? Easy. Because as children, they were terribly mistreated at school. Years of neglect and taunting and mild playground torture can mark a person. 
And what better way to exorcise these frustrations than becoming a movie star and act out all of your revenge fantasies? Take octogenarian Christopher Lee, for example. He's tall with a foreboding deep voice and penetrating eyes. Lee has built a staggering career playing evil roles over the years, including Count Dracula, ten times. My revenge has spread over centuries! Recent efforts in The Lord of the Rings and Star Wars Episode 2 see Lee playing evildoers who live outside the regulations. Recalcitrants who simply won't go along with the flow, watching and waiting to strike. Sounds a lot like the tall kid at school, doesn't it? The one who never said very much, but you knew there was something going on up there. Wanting to lash out, only showing the pain if you stared in his eyes long enough to see the tears. Like Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, his hammer horror film partner in crime, was also most likely an ill-treated boy in the playground. When you see the drawn, pained look on his face, it's obvious. Not a happy chappy. Cushing often played Van Helsing to Lee's Dracula and incidentally accepted the role of Grand Moff Tarkin in Star Wars after Lee turned it down. Which explains everything about Cushing's contemplations on screen. Peter Cushing was the boy who was always second best. You don't know how hard I found it. The current actors cast often as the villain demonstrate complexes and issues that would make Hannibal Lecter's jaw drop. Gary Oldman, Dracula, Lee Harvey Oswald, Dr. Zachary Smith, all psychotics. Your pain, Major, has just begun. This guy is a powder keg waiting to explode. Gary Oldman was the nasty boy in the chair behind you who kicked you constantly, called your names, wrote on your pencil case, then teasingly rebuilt your trust, only to vanquish it again by stealing your Duran Duran lunchbox. The Oldman complex shows that in his roles. He performs both the aggressor and the victim, screaming, I'm gonna get you and nut me again at the same time. Very sad. Drug therapy is often prescribed for hyperactive children. When you think of what Dennis Hopper must have been like as a child, and what his life could have been, it's a tragedy. Why are they messing with me? Do they think I'm doing this for fun? Often resorting to technology to enhance his villainy, Hopper's choice of role demonstrates a combination of bitter geek and gang member syndrome, where at times he resorts to bomb threats and false alarm type pranks. If caught off guard or cast by Kevin Costner, he will turn aggressive, but only if surrounded by plenty of backup to intimidate his victim. Everyone can remember the big tough boy you walked on the other side of the street to avoid. Robert De Niro is Al Capone. De Niro. There is violence in Chicago, of course, but not by me and not by anybody. The films of Robert De Niro sum up his wish to be understood and not dumped in the less complex pile, but in the extra complex group. Not as stylish as Brando, but bigger than Pacino, De Niro is one of the last tough guys. His case is simple. He looks like a thug, he plays thugs well. Evil has many faces, and the faces of the actors that play evil are just some of them. The thought that keeps me sane at night is that these mean men in the movies were once scared little boys and needed a disciplinary clip across the ear. I often like to imagine myself administering one. There will only be one Jack Nicholson. Movie star, ladies man, cool guy. Shades permanently fixed to his face and flashing that shark grin. Jack has a lot to smile about. Jack's movies always seem to hit the mark with audiences and critics. He's won a Best Actor Oscar three times and has been nominated more times than anyone else. Face it, this guy is Mr. Smooth. He wants to know if I'm nice and relaxed. Jack! 
His life contained its fair share of struggle. He was abandoned in childhood by his father and in a situation not far from a movie script, grew up thinking that his grandmother was his mother and his mother his older sister. Jack only discovered this melodramatic twist as an adult. He toyed with acting while at school. After graduating, he visited LA, decided to settle and he began to study acting. Television and stage roles soon came his way. His first break came in the film The Crybaby Killer. From this time, he is best remembered for his first eccentric character as masochistic Wilberforce in The Little Shop of Horrors. Bye. Bye now. Seemingly stuck on the B list, Jack may do with what success he had in the business. Spending less time acting, Jack began in earnest to write his own film scripts, penning The Trip, a groundbreaking acid culture film that starred Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda. In preparation for the film, the trio took LSD to research the effects of the drug. Jack's reputation as a party man was now cemented. Fonda and Hopper had launched their own film project, Easy Rider, and the producers employed Jack to keep an eye on the pair. This is grass. An actor playing a pivotal role in the piece dropped out of the project and the friends encouraged a reluctant Jack to take on the role. He got to see her see a um, scissor happy beautify America thing going on around here. They're trying to make everybody look like Yule Brenner. The film struck a chord with the disillusioned youth of the time and Jack gained his first Oscar nomination. Jack was now on his way. He starred in 70s films that defined the era. Roman Polanski's Chinatown, and Jack's signature movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, for which he won his first Best Actor Oscar. Is that crazy enough for you? Now a movie icon, Jack became noted for his unpredictable choice of project. Sometimes the real challenge is to do something very light because everyone else is doing very heavy stuff. Although his reputation as a ladies' man was well known in Hollywood, Jack had been in a long-term relationship with actress Angelica Houston. That's here. All the lights on? Yeah. Right here. But after 17 years, the relationship floundered, with the news that another woman was expecting Jack's child. It's doubtful Tim Burton's Batman would have achieved its box office heights without Jack Nicholson's flamboyant Joker. His over-the-top portrayal redefined modern villainy and made every A-lister want to be the next Batman bad guy. You want to investigate me? Roll the dice and take your chances. Jack's villainous characters are on the edge, out of control and maniacal. You only have to sit and watch Jack on screen to feel your own blood pressure rising. You can't handle the truth! In reality, he is reportedly as kind and caring as he is charismatic. Jack Nicholson has worked hard for his success. He has played hard and certainly loved a lot too. Some say I'm an expert on the subject. Guess that's because I've been dating them for over 40 years. And his wolfish cunning will be celebrated in cinema for some years to come. You're dating my daughter? Now who would have thought that would be worse news?